uh, in these <laughs> deserts. And uh, I want to begin this presentation with uh, another desert, which is Black Rock Desert uh, in Utah, where I got taken with a new uh, set. I saw this book uh, out there being new uh, to shoot a movie called The Most Unknown, uh, which was visible on Netflix, but it's now, I think you can still see it on YouTube. Uh, and it's a great movie about science, the nine scientists and the fields meet each other for the first time to explain to each other what it is they're doing. And my bit was in this desert where I met uh, an exobiologist or someone who's interested in life outside of the earth. And uh, the closest you can get is uh, the uh, archaea and bacteria that live in the hot springs uh, that are like 70 degrees Celsius, so not, nothing lives in there except for this uh, bacteria. And uh, I use this picture as a way of beginning this general lecture about consciousness uh, uh, as a way of illustrating what I felt when I was standing there. Uh, actually, uh, you can't see it anymore, but uh, this is actually me uh, in this desert. This was shot from the drone, and I was looking at this immensity in front of me. Uh, the playa sand was also very particular. Of course, it was steering hot um, in this desert. It was close to uh, 45 degrees Celsius, I think. And uh, it was really a special experience to be there. And this is what one means by conscious mental states. Uh, there are states that it feels like something to be in. And in this particular case, I had sensations, uh, the bizarre floor, uh, the visual um, uh, immensity, the temperature. Uh, I also had uh, emotions. I felt really happy to be there. Uh, and it was a little bit foreboding to uh, see all of uh, that. And I was also thinking, uh, I was eager to begin shooting whatever we uh, saw uh, in the desert. And all these sensations, those thoughts, and those um, emotions combined to define your presence to the world at a particular moment in time. And that is uh, what we mean by subjective experience or consciousness. Now, this takes a long time to work, but uh, this is going to be faster. Now, I'm going to show this is about consciousness. And we know that consciousness is produced by the biological activity of the brain. And we know that the brain is an extremely complex object. Uh, it has about 86 billion neurons, 10k connections uh, with uh, other neurons. And um, if you take a materialist perspective on consciousness, all those thoughts, those sensations, and those emotions have to be uh, produced by the biological activity of the brain. And of course, no one understands how the biological activity of the brain produces those mental states. And that is why consciousness has taken to be one of the uh, most significant problems of the 21st century. <laughs> and so uh, here you see John Searle, uh, who captured uh, these intuitions about consciousness by uh, writing that consciousness consists of those states of sensation, of feeling, or awareness, which begin in the morning when we awake from a dream of sleep and continue. Well, the day until we fall into a coma or die or fall asleep again or otherwise become unconscious. Now, when I give this quote to people uh, in general, they sort of um, dismiss it that it's so vague, you know, um, it's a philosopher's uh, definition that doesn't really have a clear content, but I think it captures the fact that um, we have these intuitions about consciousness. It's an immediate data of our experience. Um, but the fact remains that nobody knows how the biological activity of the brain is in uh, mental states. Nobody knows what it's like to be a bat. And as you know, probably that was the title of a famous philosophical paper written by Thomas Nagel in 1974 already, in which he defended the claim that we could know as much as we can about the biological uh, activity of the brain of a bat, we still wouldn't know what it feels like to be the bat living in the Antarctic using a sensory system from which soda 
was later inspired. And so his point was to say, well, consciousness is a private phenomenon. We cannot access other people's mental states. And it's unclear, and maybe there's, there could be some discussion about this, it's unclear how much you can get about the mental states by looking at the biological activity of the brain. Some people are trying decoding quite successfully of mental, of reconstructing mental states based on the uh, biology. But even if you can do that, you still wouldn't be able to be the fact that you need to do things like that. That was Nagel's point. And uh, it's also connected with uh, what Chalmers called the heart problem, uh, which is um, uh, to say that um, all the problems that cognitive neuroscience worries about perception, language, um, uh, decision making, uh, and so on, those are what he calls easy problems of consciousness. The problems of consciousness, because everything in psychology or in cognitive neuroscience is about consciousness, uh, in a way, or lack of it, but anyway, it's always taking place. On a conscious background. Um, but so there's all these easy problems. And then consciousness, according to uh, Thomas, what this is, this singular problem. Uh, it's a unique uh, issue uh, because, um, according to him, we can imagine uh, zombies. Uh, we can imagine that there's a disconnect between the functions, or the functional aspects of consciousness, and the phenomenal aspects of consciousness. And there's no good account of why it feels like anything at all, uh, and of why all this information processing uh, activity cannot go on as it would in a zombie that is in the dark without phenomenal experience. And so one seems to hit a wall there because once you've exhausted all the functional explanations that you can um, invoke to account for what you do. You still seem to have a problem, which is the heart problem, which is to account for phenomenal experience, right? Uh, in some ways, it appears as though it, uh, it's an extra ingredient uh, that comes only after uh, all the functional aspects that we take to the And that makes um, understanding consciousness uh, a hard problem. Some people would debate it, some would also debate about all uh, the values. But here's an illustration of a few. Of uh, Thomas's easy problems. Uh, here you see the uh, Venus flytrap capturing an insect uh, using biological mechanisms that are surprisingly complex. Um, but the point is to say, well, nobody can call flight responsible, uh, morally responsible for the death of the insect, right? It could be the um, And uh, perhaps more importantly, it's not aware of the fact that it's doing it, right? Maybe some of you would ascribe consciousness to the plant. But I think most people's intuitions would say, well, no, the plant is just a little mechanism. It's a, it's a living thing uh, that can sense its uh, environment and can make decisions uh, in a way, even though the decision is triggered automatically. So the leaf would close as soon as the insect has triggered three of the little hairs uh, on the surface uh, of the leaf. Uh, but um, it's not in virtue of the fact that it's sensitive to its environment that you can describe consciousness. So consciousness is not sensitive. Another easy problem, uh, we can look at AI and robotics here in particular. Uh, these are astounding feats uh, for this Atlas robot built by this uh, Kerry Buckton Dynamics company, which Google bought and then sold them. Uh, it's amazing. Nobody could do this sort of 10 years ago, right? It's uh, just incredible to have a system that's capable of real time performance uh, with such a degree of skill. And it really does, you know, when you watch those robots, that they have some intentions. Uh, it, it feels like they're agents of their own behavior. Uh, but again, you may perceive agency, but again, agency is not conscious. So I think most people would, again, not describe. And it's phenomenal consciousness to robots, despite the fact that it seems to be able to um, follow uh, a sophisticated um, uh, program uh, to drive their behavior. And likewise for AI systems, uh, everybody talks about ChatGPT and whether ChatGPT is conscious or not. Uh, before ChatGPT was another uh, stupendous feat of uh, AI. Which is uh, DeepMind's AlphaGo, which met Lisa Dahl, 
as the blue world champion. Uh, I think it was now three years ago. But again, when AlphaGo wins the tournament against Sedol, it's Dennis Hassibis and the people from DeepMind who drink the champagne. It's not AlphaGo, right? AlphaGo is not even aware that it's taking part in the tournament. It's not even aware that it won this tournament. It's not even aware of the fact that uh, everybody will talk about this amazing achievement. Uh, in other words, it's not confident, right? It's not confident. So confidence is not intelligence. And then all these questions also play out when you think about animal consciousness. So, so this is a huge uh, issue that has ethical implications. And again, here it's very surprising to see this crowd um, trying to get out this little bucket out of this uh, glass cylinder using a straight uh, metal wire, basically. And of course, it doesn't work. And then, amazingly enough, he builds a hook by uh, you know twisting the wire around the base of the uh, container. And now it's able to take this little bucket out and get the nut. Uh, he won't. So, uh, yeah, okay, he's clearly intelligent, and uh, people like Nicola Clayton, who worked with uh, Corbett, have demonstrated, and so have other people, uh, that you can chain up to 10 of these kinds of problems. Uh, and the cause are extremely good at solving that, surprisingly good at solving them. Uh, so, they're clearly intelligent. Uh, are they conscious? Is there something it's like to be a problem? Well, my intuition says yes. Definitely something uh, it is like to be found, but what about the slug? Yeah, maybe a fly, I don't know, uh, an earthworm, or perhaps. I remember asking this question in one of my classes in Brussels, and then the whole idea is to go down, right? So, I don't know, microbes are microbes conscious? Some people would say yes, but when I asked the question, I began with dog. So I asked an audience like this, you know. Who thinks dogs are conscious? And there's one guy that raises his hand. And so <laughs> I couldn't go down because no one was <laughs> with this demonstration. But uh, that's very surprising. I don't know. Who thinks a dog is conscious? There's at least one person who thinks a dog is not conscious. But what <laughs> Okay, so. That is the problem of consciousness. Now, importantly, I talked about symmetric experiments, but consciousness is not a single thing. There's at least three aspects that one needs to distinguish. One is um, the difference between the level of consciousness and the contents of consciousness. The second is the tripartite distinction between perceptual consciousness, self consciousness, and consciousness of other people. And then the third is the distinction. Which is important in the philosophy of mind, mostly between experience and function, between what people have called access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness. Um, so I'll go quickly through this. The notion of level of consciousness is basically intransitive and it refers to the state of wakefulness. You're either open, you're responding and interacting with the uh, environment. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a feature of you as an agent. Uh, and by contrast, the notion of contents of consciousness is transitive and it refers to the fact that you're always conscious of something. Um, so you're aware of the fact that you're listening to me, you're aware of the fact that you're in Egypt, you're aware of the fact that uh, you're hungry, there's always this R, right? So contents of consciousness always have an object. And the point is that wakefulness and awareness can be so cheap. So when we sleep, we're obviously unconscious from a state uh, or level point of view because we're not interacting with the mm -hmm. outside world anymore. But clearly, there's contents. Uh, you can dream, you have dreams, and sometimes those dreams are even so powerful, it's a nightmare that they can wake you up, right? So, uh, and uh, again, by contrast, you have the opposite distinction in conditions like uh, non responsive wakefulness, uh, which um, used to be called vegetative state. Uh, which is a condition in which patients are awake, they display sleep, uh, uh, wakefulness uh, cycles, uh, and so on and so forth. They, they can open their eyes, but there's nobody over. 
it doesn't feel like there's contents of any kind. They look like an act or feel like the results. And of course, this is all the work of uh, Stephen Lorez and Adrian Bowen uh, at uh, Yale and uh, in Toronto, uh, who have uh, spent a lot of time looking at these issues. Uh, so there's different um, uh, ways for levels and contents to dissociate. Long consumers both are high, polar both are low, vegetative state, or uh, minimal uh, responsive, uh, not unresponsive uh, wakefulness. Um, you have levels of consciousness, okay, but no contents. And then there's uh, many, many conscious states where it fluctuates. And then there's so, this blocking syndrome, which I'm sure you know about, where people are typically as a result of um, park accidents and regions in particular small structures in the uh, cerebral uh, shrunk um, have become completely paralyzed. So they can't, they're sort of imprisoned in the own body. Completely normal consciousness, it's just that they cannot interact in any way except uh, by means of very small movements like uh, one I did. Uh, there was this great um, a book written uh, by somebody who found himself in uh, uh, Rockland Syndrome, which is the French journalist uh, Bobby, uh, who wrote the book with Gaston uh, de Batillon, uh, out of which the movie was made. He dictated the entire book for the system using his one island to pick letters of the alphabet uh, and described in the book how horrible it is uh, for him to be taken to be a uh, vegetative state mission. Vegetative state patients, there's no contact really. But in Lockdown syndrome people, uh, they have completely normal awareness. And so if you treat it as though you're not there, but you are, uh, there's a lot of uh, suffering, uh, unfortunately. Um, and so this is a very important issue to make a distinction between unfunded wakefulness patients and Lockdown. Patients and uh, at some point, uh, now has estimated that up to 40% of patients are misdiagnosed. And this, this is one of the most important clinical uh, aspects of consciousness treatment, to understand the variety, uh, the disorders of consciousness in terms of uh, uh, levels and uh, uh, contents of consciousness. So you can organize these state or on a two dimensional graph. <laughs> With uh, coma here and conscious wakefulness uh, here, and all these intermediate states um, uh, Here's a patient uh, that uh, Lorenz worked with. And if you look at this patient, he has the clinical features of the patient in the vegetative state. But as the camera turns around, you can see that the patient is actually interacting with his email program. By means of eye movements. And so he's completely normal, uh, in fact, uh, in terms of um, uh, his ability to uh, manipulate content. So this is a patient who is in London, uh, as opposed to being in a vegetative state. Um, and you probably remember this uh, science paper where uh, Owen and I showed how to use real time MRI to communicate with these patients. Um, by giving them instructions to imagine moving around um, their house uh, if they want to answer yes to a question or imagine uh, playing tennis uh, if they want to answer no to a question, right? And this, these mental imagery activities elicit activity in different brain regions, which you can track from, uh, using MRI in real time. So you can actually have a conversation with these patients and establish for instance that the patient is indeed in a locked in syndrome as opposed to being in a non responsive money um, condition. So that was the first distinction levels versus contents. Uh, here is the second one. Um, and the only point I want to make here is that consciousness is not the same thing as self consciousness. So perceptual awareness is not the same thing as being aware of yourself as an uh, agent. And then self consciousness is again not the same thing as your mind, which is philosophical jargon uh, to designate uh, the ability that we have to 
attribute mental states, conscious mental states to other people. Uh, so our ability to understand other people's mental states and to understand their relations. And there's complex relationships between these three aspects of consciousness uh, that come about in uh, pathological conditions uh, such as autism, that come about in philosophical debates about the relationships between our ability to attribute and uh, consciousness to ourselves and to recognize that we are conscious and our ability to attribute consciousness to other people. Uh, yeah. Yes, pathologies such as autism, in which uh, people's ability to attribute consciousness to um, other people seems to be uh, impaired, where self awareness seems to be relatively blurred. So, to that, that's not exactly the same thing. Other people have argued uh, that there are close links between self consciousness and theory of mind, that it's basically the same mechanisms uh, involved in both cases. Uh, those are ideas by Gerhardus, for instance. Uh, who defends even strongly the idea that in a way theory of mind comes before self awareness. So we become aware of ourselves in virtue of the fact that we have to uh, understand other people's mental states. Uh, there's a lot to laugh about this, but that I agree. And then the uh, trickiest distinction of this uh, set of distinctions is the distinction between access consciousness and parallel consciousness. Uh, which is a uh, terminology that was uh, developed by the philosopher Ned Black uh, to distinguish between the functional aspect of consciousness, uh, what it is that consciousness enables us to do, on the one hand, so all the, all the functions uh, associated with conscious mental states, or ability to manipulate conscious representations, or ability to reason, to talk about our mental states, to report about them, to describe them, and so on and so forth. And uh, on the other hand, what uh, we call phenomenal consciousness, which is uh, the subjective experience that is associated with conscious mental states and not with unconscious mental states. All conscious mental states uh, feel like something for you to be uh, in them. And this question of whether those two aspects dissociate uh, and under which uh, conditions is, is a really tricky question. Uh, and it's the object of an intense debate, um, both in the philosophical literature, but also in the uh, cognitive literature, for instance, um, about attention, right? So it is, it is an old question um, about uh, the fact that um, maybe the case that attention selects the most of the phenomenon of yield uh, that is already there, contents that need to be processed further, or it may be the case that attention truly is the gateway to consciousness. So you have all sorts of unconsciously processed stimuli that arrive in the external world, and that attention selects a few of those, and those are the contents that you become consciously aware of. So that's the sort of question that plays out uh, here. There's also a long continuing debate about the richness of uh, perception or of phenomenology. So there, there are these overflow arguments, for instance, that your phenomenal field appears to be bigger than what you can report on. So report is active consciousness, your phenomenal field is phenomenal consciousness. Think of the spurring experiment in which people are exposed to, you know, a number, a number of numbers or letters uh, on, on, on a screen, and they can only report a few, but they have the impression. A very difficult impression of having seen the entire array of say nine metrics, right? But they, they can only report three. Um, on the course. Yeah, so uh, there's two questions you can ask in those of like, access versus um uh, consciousness. One is how are we conscious? So how is the biological way uh, producing mental states? And the other is why are we conscious? Why is it the case that there is phenomenal experience uh, at all? And that, in a way, is a question about the function of consciousness. Uh, why are consciousness selected? Um, and clearly, this is what I'm trying to do on uh, focus on with a new York City project that I just obtained. And in a way, if you look at this distinction, you know, this how the functional aspects, what 
consciousness does to one and all aspects for consciousness of the field life. And I'm struck by the fact that in other neuroscience, people have focused on the mechanisms, the neural correlates, and they've basically concluded in many cases that phenomenal experience doesn't do much, right? Uh, it's a lot of stuff uh, in the cognitive neuroscience literature uh, purporting to show how much you can do with other ones, right? Because even people claim that you can do arithmetic uh, without uh, awareness. Uh, there's people claiming that you taking better decisions, not thinking about the problem than actually thinking about it. So unconscious processing is um, uh, um, more powerful in a way uh, than unconscious processing. And in the philosophical literature, there's Dr. Morgan uh, purporting to um, uh, show that mental states can be causally affected. There's a skin's exclusion argument. Uh, these are all the debates about free will, for instance, in the words of uh, Wagner. Um, you have the illusion of free will, but you don't really have free will. Uh, and um, of course, illusionist positions have also gained quite a bit of strength. Uh, Cardiano was here, so maybe we'll hear something about uh, illusionism uh, during the meeting. Um, and so the Nordic idea is that uh, an hour of experience has no function. So there's no purpose to feel things. Uh, in a way, I think it's completely mistaken. And so what I'm trying to do now is to show that um, actually we need to dismantle this distinction between access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness, and instead recognize that the function of consciousness is to give value to what we do. I'll come back to that later um, because there's strong arguments sort of showing that you would refuse to be zombified. If I give you a billion dollars, uh, but the consequence of that is that you get to keep all your love and all goods, but it, nothing feels like anything anymore. You just become a zombie, right? Would you take it? Well, no, probably not, unless you, know, you, you, you save the life of someone who loved by sacrificing. Sacrificing your phenomenal experience. But why would you not do it? Well, because what would be the point of living if, it, if the living wasn't doing something to you? What would be the point? Right? So that means that we value the consciousness. Maybe consciousness is um, the thing, the very thing that gives value to the thing that we do. Right? So, That's what I'm saying here. What would be the point of doing anything at all if it really wasn't doing something to you? So I think conscious agents care about their experiences in a way that zombies or AIs do not. And so consciousness matters, basically. Uh, phenomenal consciousness matters. And this I call the phenomenal of privacy. And even drop the point. This distinction between access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness seems to recognize this because he wrote uh, in a book which is in it's amazing. Uh, it's just got a huge book uh, over 600 pages long, Oxford University Press. It's available for free, uh, so you can download it, it's wonderful. And in the intro to that, and the intro has the length of the book, but uh, it's really, really good. Uh, he says, I favor the first order point of view. Uh, if, the, if the first order point of view is right, it may be conscious phenomenology that provokes global broadcasting, something like the reverse of what the global workspace theory of consciousness supposes. But I find this very interesting coming from Locke uh, that he says, well, according to global workspace theory, it is in virtue of the global broadcast or the global availability of information that we are phenomenally conscious of those events. And he seems to say the opposite. He says, well, maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's not in virtue of the fact that information is globally available that we are phenomenally aware of. Maybe it's uh, because we're phenomenally aware of certain contents that they become globally available. So it's reversing um, the, uh, the reasoning here. And it's connected with what I just described as this phenomenal privacy. I'm not a first order to this now, but 
this point of view is compatible with the higher order of theories and functions. So we're talking about the theories of consciousness. You'll hear a lot about the theories of consciousness in the coming days. Um, obviously, you cannot be anyone in this field if you if you don't have your own theory of consciousness. <laughs> Everybody has its own theory of consciousness. <laughs> Uh, but there's a few there's a few categories, right? There's dualism, mysterialism. This is a little bit out of fashion now. Uh, this is picking up a lot of theme, illusionism, epic phenomenalism. So maybe we're conscious, but if we are, it's an illusion of a certain kind. New physics, yes, and then this is probably the, the most widespread uh, perspective on consciousness. Which is simply that it's an emergent property of And it was, yeah, uh, the text is too small, but I was taken by Claire Sergent's Global Playground, which is a text play in the global workspace. And then the, this is the, what is it? The Conscious Agent Model uh, by uh, Hoffman. I'm very curious to hear about that. So, you know, everybody has known positions. Was which I went to uh, if I can get to this uh, talk uh, in uh, the hour that I had. But if, I think if you look at it, the whole thing, for me, there's two big ideas. One is Dennis, uh, and basically saying consciousness is plain and direct, so it's connected with the global work, it's connected with the hard ideas. Plain and direct, by this, Dennis means something like. Okay, you're famous when you're on television. Uh, and television makes you famous because everybody sees you, right? And so, according to Dennett, it's the same story with mental states. And maybe some mental states win the competition that is continuously ongoing in the brain, um, competition between different interpretations of what's going on. And some of those uh, representations win the competition, and those are those from the contents of consciousness, and that is what consciousness amounts to. And then you have um, a completely different idea by David Rosenthal, also an American philosopher. And according to Rosenthal, um, conscious mental states are mental states that are re described by what he calls high order thought. Um, and it's the re description that makes those mental states conscious mental states. So if I look at my glasses here, there's a pattern that is characteristic of those glasses in my visual cortex. That's an unconscious mental state. It's only going to be a conscious mental state if there's a matter representation. Rosenthal calls this a high order thought from somewhere presumably in the prefrontal cortex. To the effect that now there's this representation, this pattern of neural activity in my visual cortex. Um, so it's in virtue of the existence of a high order thought that you yourself are in this particular mental state, that you are conscious of that particular mental state. It's a bit counterintuitive, perhaps, but uh, that's my favorite sort of broad um, perspective on uh, consciousness. Um, it's this uh, pointing relationship uh, between uh, high order re descriptions of lower level. Um, of mental states or lower levels of um, patterns of, of activity. Okay, here's the neural workspace, which is the best instantiation of this pain in the brain idea. Are we able to this on the work of Bernie Collins? And okay, according to the neural workspace, you know the story, probably the brain is a collection of uh, uh, processors or modules that are able to automatically process. Their uh, contents, let's say visual um, uh, input, linguistic input, and so on and so forth. And all that work can go, uh, can go on automatically, but in some cases, the outputs of those modules connect with um, a particular set of high level of modules that are heavily interconnected and that form the global workspace, a sort of hub in the brain. Um, and you can see, of course, that. Um, in virtue of this network being a hub, uh, the contents that enter it become globally available to a variety of consumer uh, systems in the brain. 
And so that is what consciousness amounts to its uh, presence uh, in this uh, global world space, uh, which extends over a wide set of uh, areas uh, in the brain, engaging frontal, temporal, and horizon. Rosenthal's idea is a bit harder to uh, capture graphically, but uh, Rosenthal says a mental state is a conscious. It's conscious if we are conscious of being in that mental state. So you see, it immediately presupposes the existence of a subject whose experience is um, experience of harm. We are conscious of being in a mental state when we have a thought that we are in that mental state. In some sense, Rosenthal, a mental state is conscious. It's conscious of mental state in virtue of having a high order thought that you yourself are in that mental state. So common misconception about high order thought theories of consciousness is that you're sort of continuously walking around uh, thinking over and seeing my master's food and giving a lecture. This is mistaken, right? So um, those high order thoughts are not conscious themselves, right? So you remain unconscious of these high order descriptions. But it's the existence of those high order descriptions that make the target first order functions conscious, right? Um, if, when you become aware of a high order thought, well, that Rosenthal would say that's a third uh, order thought, right? Because you become aware of the existence of a second order, third uh, order thought. So you're describing a first order. Right. So two big ideas, global workspace, high order thought. Yeah. Sorry, does it depend on seeing the meta consciousness or meta awareness? What's the difference? Uh, just for this. Seeing the meta awareness. So are you asking about meta cognition and high order thought? Yes. Well, obviously, yeah, metacognition involves the same sorts of mechanisms that are envisioned by a high order thought, except that metacognition is often explicit, uh, and, and high order thought does not require the link between the higher order state and the first order state to be explicit, right? Just that can exist unconsciously. So, metacognition is a form of explicit redescription. Uh, which takes place unconsciously in the case of high order thought. So, I need to redo my imagination here. That's kind of a great. So, you have all these theories and they float in a sort of conceptual space. So, we have global workspace uh, theory, high order thought theory, predictive processing. I'm not going to talk much about that, but it's also for some people. Uh, taking it as a theory of consciousness, social theories, uh, Cardiano was talking about that. IIT, uh, which is also there, but it's going to um, go away because I'm still not to do it. And amongst those that are left, I think there's a temptation, at least for me, uh, but not many people like this, uh, to sort of take some of this from each. Uh, and build a uh, oops, no, 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 no. Oh, we're not going to go through it again, huh? There's a temptation, we have to go through it again, so there's a temptation to link some aspects of all these uh, theories and try to come the ones. And maybe that's, that's, that's right. Maybe those theories each have elements that are connected. Well, it's a piece of the puzzle, and there's, there's a, a big integration story uh, that we need to develop that links these different uh, theories. Or maybe it is the case that um, one of them is correct and all the others are wrong. Uh, we don't know. We don't know this. But one story that I like is we go from predictive processing and apply that to social interactions, in particular during the cognitive development. I think that leads one to develop meta representations of exactly the kind one needs uh, to make uh, higher order thought theories of consciousness work. And uh, I think there's, there's also a way in which you can make the global workspace story just fall out of uh, 
high order of properties. But that is to be seen. Okay, we'll come back to the theories uh, later. Um, what I want to do now is uh, go over um, the question of how we build the science of consciousness. This is Chalmers in 1996. Um, who's there? Uh, he's meeting, uh, wielding his uh, consciousness meter, which is a, um, uh, which of course is a hand wire, and complaining of the fact that uh, we don't have a way of measuring consciousness. We don't have a way of looking at small mental states. Uh, consciousness is a private phenomenon, uh, as Nagel argued. Uh, and the only uh, way that we can access uh, those natural contents is by getting people to talk about it. And that's, of course, a huge um, issue the fact that we don't have a consciousness meter uh, like that. And developing a measure of the consciousness is a huge uh, endeavor. It really is, it could be at the very top of what people try to do, both behavior but also neural, right? Um, I think we'll hear about great work uh, trying to figure out um, if the brain is conscious by uh, using this uh, uh, tic tac, I think, uh, strategy of stimulating the brain and then uh, registering uh, its response. That's one way of developing a sort of test of consciousness or uh, a measure of consciousness. Uh, but if you're a psychologist like me, we're also interested in the sort of behavioral measures that we can use. And I uh, wanted to illustrate this with a study that we did a few years ago. Very simple story. Um, you ask people, so people see one of four shapes, and then the shape has mask. And then they have to do two things. They have to indicate which shape was presented. And of course, we vary uh, the uh, SOA between the stimulus and the mask. So that in some cases, the, the, the stimulus is very visible. In other cases, it's very hard uh, to see. So people indicate which they saw, and then uh, they have to um, indicate a judgment about the decision uh, on a four-point scale, uh, but crucially three different scales. One with uh, perceptual awareness scale, which asks people, uh, one, I didn't see anything, two, I had a brief glimpse, three, I had an almost clear experience, four, I had a perfectly clear impression of the stimulus, the seventh scale was the confidence of judgment. So people made the decision, and then uh, they the told one, I'm guessing, or I'm absolutely certain I got, I got it right. And then the third was post decision wagering, uh, which is a sort of confidence judgment, except it's quantified. So your people gamify, your people bet on the decision. They can earn the money that they bet, right, if they're right. So if they bet one, Basically, it's low confidence that they're, they're not risking a lot of money. Um, if uh, they bet four, uh, they're absolutely certain that the uh, decision was correct. And what you see here is the time. So these are invisible stimuli, fully visible stimuli. Uh, the four points for each of the three scales perceptual awareness, confidence ratings, post decision wager. And what we're looking at is how people use the scale points, basically, how often they uh, use each of the four scale points. And what you can see with post decision wagering, for instance, is that people exhibit a rough transition between betting very low amounts up until the point of about 96 milliseconds of this away where the stimulus becomes visible. And at that point, we switch to betting very high. So, you look at this and you think, oh, consciousness is, uh, perceptual awareness is binary. It's, it's uh, either on or off, which is the story that Global Works describes, because it envisions ignition to Global Works and a very sharply non linear transition between unconscious content and conscious content. But you get a completely different story if you look at uh, post perceptual awareness here, where you see that the transition between uh, how people judge their own perception of the stimulus is a lot more gradual. So you look at this and you think, well, consciousness is a greater phenomenon uh, because people are able to uh, use those intermediate uh, points here 
you're able to say, well, I saw something, but I'm not sure why, and it's relevant and so on and so forth. So what is the case? The jury is still out, I think. But the point I want to emphasize here is simply the fact that the measure that we use influences your theoretical development in ways that are um, uh, uh, that are sort of really interesting. And this is also um, uh, reflected perhaps uh, in this great paper by Ikai Gahon and uh, uh, Lucia Meloni and uh, yeah, Michael Pitt and Liat uh, uh, um that came out uh, a couple of years ago now, in which they looked at um, the dominant degrees of soul consciousness, uh, including global workspace and recruiting processing and IIT and uh, HOT, which is there. Tiny uh, slice of viral uh, theories, and first of all, so they look at they look at the empirical literature, trying to find which paper supported which uh, theory, and uh, this is the um, uh, distribution. So there's not many, many more papers dedicated to global workspace than to uh, the other theories. But most importantly, those papers manage support the theories, but challenge the theories, almost no paper challenges the theories, right? And this is this is a symptom of what we're not doing what we should uh, as a community, because instead of designing experiments that are that have the power of making it possible to execute or, or falsify all the theories, we're sort of proceeding in silos really where few leaders Promote a certain way of doing uh, empirical research or consciousness that fits with the theoretical uh, ideas. And there's very little work that I used to uh, actually compare the different theories or uh, evaluate uh, theories. And why is this important? Well, again, this is an example of a situation that we uh, looked at about 10 years ago now. Again, about this question of is consciousness weighted for the consciousness? And uh, what uh, Def Miller, who was my PhD student at the time, found is that most studies done in the global workplace perspective, uh, that is, studies uh, connected with uh, the hands of you, tend to use uh, high level stimuli and paradigms that involve high level decisions, uh, such as deciding uh, whether a number is smaller or larger than five. Um, but if you look at uh, other perspectives, such as Lamas uh, recurrent uh, profiting theory, uh, which is completely different than the tools that uh, for the sort of low level of phenomenon, um, you find that he uses completely different stimuli. He uses gravings, very low level stimuli, or colors, um, and then people are uh, to express judgments about those low, low level stimuli. And so, what we try to do is to design an experiment. In which the very same simply can be um, involved in a high level task or in a low level task. And so we use current numbers uh, that are masked uh, and manipulated so that we can do that physics side. Um, so, in one condition, people have to say, is the number smaller or larger than five? In the other condition, people have to decide whether uh, the digit is red or blue. Uh, so, low, low level task on the one hand, high level task on the other. And uh, there's an objective measure. People have to decide whether the number is smaller or larger than five, whether it's red or blue. And then they, uh, there's a subjective measure, which was again a pass rate. And what we found basically, and the effects, I admit, are not that huge. Uh, but as we carry the duration here, and we look at people's ability to uh, make the decision correctly, we see so somewhat more nonlinear uh, psychophysical curve for the high level decisions than for the low level decisions. And the same plays out uh, in subjective ability. So this is at least subjective, presented that what you do uh, in your paradigm uh, has implications about the nature of these relationships. Now, how do we address this? Well, there's this great program of adversarial collaborations going on now. This is financed by the Federal Global Charity Foundation, 
in the program they call accelerating research on consciousness. And roughly the idea is okay, you get you believe with the effort. They have to sit down and imagine an experiment that will falsify one of the two degrees in persons, uh, which is really cool. And they both have to agree. Uh, and actually have to sign a paper saying, I will eat my hands uh, if uh, the experiment comes out this way, uh, or I will uh, open the champagne if it comes out that way. And so one of these initiatives uh, compared to global workplace with the IAP, there's another one comparing first order versus higher order degrees. And um, I'm leading one now with uh, Stephen Fleming uh, on uh, comparing different versions of higher order top degrees uh, of consciousness. So I think this is very exciting. It's one of the best developments in the field because it really forces people to discuss and uh, engage in dialogue in a way that the paper by Yahoo uh, showed is not the case today, where everybody is sort of keeps uh, developing its own ideas um, independently of the others. So how do we build then uh, a science of consciousness? Well, you know, this we take it as a starting point that every mental event is a neural event, and then to identify the neural currents of consciousness, you can use this contrastive method, uh, which consists of designing experimental conditions in which we make the contrast between what happens with consciousness and without consciousness, uh, everything else being as uh, variable as possible. Then, of course, you use brain imaging methods, and you combine objective and subjective data. Uh, this is the distinguishing feature, I think, of consciousness research. We always have to have the subjective data. Uh, so this interesting paradox that try to avoid asking people to report on their mental states. Those are called no reports uh, paradigms, and it's very exciting. But in general, we want to combine subjective and objective data. So we're not going to go through this, but you can deploy this contrastive method to different domains, perception, then reaction. And uh, you can imagine paradigms where subjective experience changes, but stimulation and behavior remain constant. So if I see a pink elephant at the back of the room, that's clearly something that's in my perceptual experience, but not out there in the world. Hallucinations is a great example of these uh, sort of uh, paradigms. Uh, seven row is the other thing. Subjective experience remains constant, but the stimulation changes. Blind sight in clinical uh, psychology, but also subliminal uh, perception uh, with normal participants. And then the last uh, situation is the same for action. Subjective experience remains constant, but action uh, changes. Just a few examples. I don't know if this works. Look at the covers or read it off, but you should see movement at the periphery of your visual field. Of course, there's no movement in the stimulus. It works even better in printed. If you know this illusion, probably one of the best, right? A and B are the same color, but they appear completely different. So, you know, perception, you know, how this works. Um, of course, it's not going to work here because the temporal relationship. And not good enough, but you shouldn't be able to read the words that we have these visual masks. If you do that, you find that you activate the uh, left fusiform germs, which is specifically dedicated to processing the um, uh, visual form of uh, words. But uh, the activation remains confined to that region, and that makes the contrast with the situation. Where by changing the temporal relationship between the stimulus and the mask, make the work visible. So if you do imaging of that condition, you find that you activate left pubis, fusiform generates even more, but most importantly, you activate this entire network of high level areas, uh, which, uh, according to the hand, forms the global flux. And so you have ignition and the contents of consciousness. How much time do I have? All right, let's go on. This is a phenomenon called change blindness. You know what change blindness is? 
phenomenon where something is changing, but you can see it. So this is going on here. So step two is to move it. So something is changing. You can raise your arm if you can see it, anything changing. This we use, okay. You can do this 40 times in the lab. People don't see it. <laughs> that was not the change. So nothing. Okay. And those are fine. Of this guy? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody says, oh, well, so to see it because this guy has such a weird uh, mouth. Um, and actually, the student who did this experiment is Cedric uh, Danio. And this photograph, which is taken outside of a nightclub in Yale in Belgium, coming out in that club. And so we use more regular students. So, nothing. So, what is changing is the entire facial expression of the central actor. Goes from an expression where he smiles, as is the case now. Oh. If you focus on his mouth, you just see it. And then it goes back slowly to an expression where he's emotionally mute. You see now? So you all know the gorilla example, right? Huh? So you have to count the number of times that the ball has passed. Uh, and people invoke attention to a kind of change like this, but here, you know there's something changing. Um, you don't have to do anything else but kind of change. The change happens right in the middle of your visual field, and it's big, it's not just a button. We move the whole thing. And you still know it's right. It's about emotion. What? It's also about emotion and expression. Yeah, it should be super salient. Um, but of course, it's unusual still, right? Um, but so people feel to see it. And so this is a great example of something that's happening in the world that fails to be represented in the world subjective world, the world of the subliminal processing, except the document of the world of people. You've all seen this, uh, and actually, it doesn't work here uh, because it has to do with the contrast. But in principle, so the straws black dots, but typically, if you do this on a piece of paper, if you only seeing three or four dots at the same time. So the point I want to make here is that we see things that are not there, like the movement in the schools. We fail to see things that are there, like in the change balance example. We fail to see everything that we think we do, and we see differences like in the beautiful areas in the room, uh, where there are none. And um, this made my friends and they say, well, we're all elucidating all the time. And when we agree about all the situations, that is what we call reality. Reality is just the intersection of our respective elucidation. This is something that you will get from uh, Hoffman as well, uh, who goes even further than Daniel in saying that um, consciousness just fails to represent reality because fitness trumps truth, right? What you want is represent uh, is to represent the things that matter to you that are important for your fitness, uh, not what is actually on. Um, okay, so this is a little bit about my ideas, uh, which in one version I call the radical plasticity uh, thesis, uh, because it's all about the idea that uh, consciousness is something that the brain knows to do. So in the beginning is action, and then from there, the idea is that the brain continuously and unconsciously learns to redescribe its own activity itself by assessing the consequences of action in the brain itself, which I call the inner loop on behavior, the action loop and, uh, on the behavior of other people, the mind. Uh, and so it's an instance of a higher order of thought theory because the idea is that the brain redescribes its own activity to itself, and so it's forming meta representations or higher order thought about its own activity. And the three loops depend on each other, and so they form what Huxley uh, is called a tangled uh, animal. So consciousness is then the brain's non conceptual theory about itself, which it has again two experience constructing with itself with the world. And with other people, which is something that Chris 
uh, defend uh, quite a bit. And in that sense, consciousness depends on the operation of unconscious prediction driven learned mechanisms, uh, which you can think of as a form of elective non conceptual idea. So these are these predictive loops that envision this framework. Um, this vertical compression thing um, that drive action on the world and action on other people. And this is the self overloops and the perception that you do. And it all goes back to perception. There's also this inner loop here that goes through this material presentational system whereby the brain develops three descriptions of its own activity, developing mental attitudes uh, that make it possible to characterize and qualify the first order context. We really describe the first order context. Uh, and so this group yet yeah, is involved in that activity uh, as well, except that that activity is explicit um, uh, engagement in the uh, description. Um, this is all described in the 2001 paper, I think, of that came on this. Those are examples of these uh, groups. The inner group, um, this is an experiment on monkeys. Um, they're both being imaged, so bone signal in the visual cortex and um, single cell recorded, again in the visual cortex. The brain is a cat, the stimulus that always appears to the right of fixation. So, the light appears to have a cat there, except on some cars, there's no light. And so, this is what we see here. There's the light, visual neuron spiral, the bone signal is modulated. Now, when there's no light, the monkey expects it. No visual neurons fire because there's no stimulus, but we still have a modulation of the bone signal, which is suggestive to me that the brain actually anticipates the metabolic needs of visual cortex. And so it knows something about its own functioning uh, in a way. It has this thing where it's able to adaptively predict what the metabolic requirements of the brain are processing over the next. Two seconds would be. This is an example of the action loop. Um, so the link between perception and action. Uh, these are the old experiments by Fritz uh, Streck uh, about what he called the facial feedback hypothesis. Um, so people are shown cartoons and they should judge how funny the cartoons are on a scale from one to ten. If it's really funny, you give it a ten. If it doesn't make you laugh, you give it a one. And in one position, they are told with a complicated cover story to hold a pen between their teeth uh, in the way depicted on the left. And in the other condition, they should hold a pen between the upper lip and the nose. And the finding is that people who hold a pen between the teeth find the same cartoons to be funnier than the people who hold a pen between the upper lip and the nose. This is called the facial feedback hypothesis because when you hold a pen between your teeth, your facial muscles are put in the position that they have when you smile. But, it is kind of but when you hold the pen between the upper lip and the nose, your facial muscles are put in the position that they have when you experience disgust or contempt. So the standard of your facial muscle influences your perception. So not only does perception drive action, but action, the motor activity, also drives or influences perception. Where you think there's a violent action made between perception and action. Now, there was a large scale replication effort on this finding, which failed. Uh, and I was supported it. So I'm, I'm giving uh, this data to be completely uh, uh, clear about what we should think of these um, uh, findings by Strack. But there's a complicated story there, too, because in the replication, people were filled. Um, so there was no one who was filmed. And when you hold the pen between your teeth, um, in a few minutes, you begin to be moved. And so it becomes quickly embarrassing. And there was another replication attempt which succeeded by manipulating the presence or the absence of the camera. See, with the camera, there's no effect. Without the camera, like in the original study, there was an effect. We also did another study using female participants, uh, middle aged women who underwent uh, bonus injection uh, for cosmetic surgery purposes. 
Also ein Private Corrugate wird man tun, das 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 wird man tun, And of course, if you have both of them plus just parallelized and you have a beautifully smooth face that expresses serenity as opposed to uh, expressing worry. Uh, and we ask control participants and um, uh, women who underwent this Botox injection to detect the change in these um, a change in sticky. I don't know if you saw um, There you go. So both actors. Both uh, renditions begin in the same state. Then one moves towards anger, the other moves towards happiness. Uh, I'm going to move it now. Maybe not. People have to press on the key as soon as they felt change in these displays. What we show is that uh, participants who underwent the Botox injection were slower and had more difficulty detecting changes going towards anger. Uh, specifically. So this is suggesting that in order to perceive an emotion in someone else, you ought to be able to express that emotion. And that might when you become unable to express that emotion, for instance, because your muscle is paralyzed, uh, then it's also harder to detect the emotion uh, in someone else. And this is an example of uh, this um, perception action. Now, stealthily, this is a, an experiment that is also a little bit tricky to replicate, uh, but it's a favorite of uh, Chris Frisk. Um, it's taking place in a social psychology lab. There's a coffee machine. Uh, you can take a coffee, and there's a little basket where you can eat money, so that it's nothing by no coffee to get a peek. And so the machine doesn't require a token or anything like that. It's supposed to be money. And what they deliberate is the picture that's in the fridge, or the poster. Uh, on one week it's flowers, on the other week it's art. And the defendant does it was great because it's just how much money you find in the basket. And every time his eyes and the bridge was more money in the basket. Why? Well, because it's a social presence effect, right? When you have the impression that you're being observed, you will adopt the more socially acceptable behavior, which in this case consists of doing the right thing and leaving money in the basket. Um, so that illustrates the fact that what we do is influenced by what we think about people who know about what we do. So it's a social presence effect or we're integrating uh, interpretations about other people's minds in the way we do. How do we get there? Uh, how do we get to those loops? Well, I think we get there by learning. Probably no difficulty, epidemic information. Implanted with single cell electrodes in order to detect where the uh, uh, epileptical uh, activity comes from. Um, those patients have to work with uh, uh, researchers. In one of these experiments, they just show pictures to patients. And in one patient, they find one neuron that only responds on a picture of uh, the American actress Halle Berry showing the image. In another patient, they find a Bill Clinton neuron. That only activates when pictures uh, of Bill Clinton are shown to the patient. This was really a striking result. The note that we thought there would be such high level neurons. But I think it's the clearest demonstration of the fact that whatever we experience actually gets into the biological uh, activity of the brain, gets recorded uh, in the neurons. And this is the case of the patient in France. 44 years old, complained of the weakness in the left leg. Um, history reveals that he, he had a hydrocephalus as an infant. Uh, so he was implanted with a drain to uh, evacuate the uh, liquid. Um, at 14 years of age, he, has, he complained of headache, he operated uh, on again to install the new drain. Then 30 years go by, this patient. Is in the, in the low range of normal IQs. His IQ is normal and he's completely uh, okay. He has a job, a family, etc. He behaves completely normally for the first time on the CT scan. And on the CT scan, this is what they see all the black is liquid. Uh, so the brain of this person is compressed and, and many neurons die uh, as well. But most of the brain of 
this person is depressed and all this stuff. Uh, so that's amazing. That um, because of course the hippocampus to make that there's, there's no recognizable structure. So I described it to the other doctor. Don't worry, go there. But, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> but, uh, I'm very surprised by this, and I think it's a real challenge to all theory of cultural that, that is strongly based on the architectural integrity of the brain. And it's also illustrative of the fact that uh, the brain is incredibly plastic to the point that it can adapt to an ongoing long distance injury insult like this for so many, uh, so many years and still make it possible for the person to continue to function for as long as um, okay, I think maybe I'll skip these bits because um, we're, we're getting at the end of um, just to let you know that we thought about how to implement those ideas to that type of representation and deep description using um, connectional models, so all of our connectional models. Um, and the idea being, well, these models can make decisions just like deep learning networks today. But whatever they learn is knowledge that is in the network as opposed to knowledge for the network. In other words, just like AlphaGo, the network doesn't know what it knows. It has no redescription of its own knowledge. And so if high order strong theory is not correct, uh, maybe what we need to do is to have another network that looks into the states of the first order network and tries to redescribe them in some way. Enabling them, for instance, to express cultural restrictions. And so, this is the sort of like architecture that we try to take a network, and then that entire network becomes input to another network that attempts to do something uh, in terms of re describing the activity of this network. So, you have the brain learning about the world, like one decision in this direction, and then you have this other network in which uh, the brain learning about itself. Signal detection on its own of uh, mental representations, it's like two decisions, subjective measures. And so we've done some work with our people, including the deep learning uh, networks. But the tricky thing is figuring out how to train these networks, what to train them on. Okay, here's the end of the story. Um, I mentioned predictive loops, so we all know what's going to happen when we teach that's all. This is easy, predicting the Predicting constructions for the natural world is easy. Uh, as are predicting the consequences of our own actions. I uh, can switch to that with some other, just in the very case of the world is out. What is really tricky is predicting the consequences of actions that I direct towards other people. Um, with people who I know, well, this works, I can predict what they will do, but otherwise I can't. And so I think there's a really interesting story here where action directed to another agent results in a reaction, uh, which you can then um, think about, enabling you to make predictions about the consequences of reactions that you direct towards other people. And if you do these predictions right, you have to infer the mental states the unobservable mental states of the other age. You have to assume that they're in good mood. So if I smile, you smile back. Um, <laughs> you did. Um, so maybe, you know, but in other, many other circumstances, would not. Uh, how do I understand the difference? I have to make inferences about those unobservable mental states. Um, and so in doing that, I need to develop a model for what it's like to be an agent. In my own mind, to support those predictions. Of those inferences. And the trick, I think, is that um, maybe, maybe we need to use that model of what it's like to be an agent to interpret our own mental states. So here we begin with the human mind, and then we end up with self awareness. And from self awareness, we end up with perceptual awareness to high order thought. And I think over the course of development, this is mostly what we do. We were sort of, in a way, developing the self, which is a virtual integration of all the selves that we interact with. Uh, with all the development 
I have one anecdote with my daughter, who is three or at the time or so. She runs towards me and then she crushes on the ground. And then she raises her head, she looks at me. And at that moment, I know that if I express anxiety, she will start screaming. But if I, you know, if I smile and say nothing, she will just stand up and um, I'll continue her business. It's what I did and which is what she did. But I really had the impression that I was acting as an external self for her. And at that time, she was probing me to figure out how she could feel about what was happening. I think we do this automatically in our development. We're using others as external selves, up until the point that we're capable of having itself a lower authority. Okay, uh, I think I'll just leave it there. There's another interesting rest of the story, but um, okay, I'll leave you with this. <laughs>